So now we begin the last part of our program, which is a panel of distinguished professors here from UCLA to talk about uh, taxes and trade. Uh, we've heard a lot about that today, and, and mm. our panelists <coughs> will either leave us with lots of food for thought or maybe make some, uh, some sense out of what is going on. Uh, what I want to do is, um, so briefly, just by title, introduce each of the panelists so that we can dive into the, uh, the meat of the discussion. And, uh, and so we start with uh, in the same order? Oh, they sat in the same order, oh, wow. mostly. Uh, so uh, you all know uh, Professor Lemer. Uh, and then we have uh, Michael Storper, who is Distinguished Professor of Regional and International Development in Urban Planning, Director of Global Public Affairs at UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. And uh, Michael specializes in, uh, in urban economics and, and uh, spatial geography, uh, and is going to bring some uh, real interesting perspective to our conversation. Uh, Eric Zolt, who is the Michael H. Schill Distinguished Professor of Law here at UCLA Law, and, uh, and will give us more insight on the legal aspects. Uh, and uh, Professor Sebastian Edwards, who is Professor of Global Economics and Management, the Henry Ford the second chair in international management and director of the uh, Center for Global Management here at Anderson. So let me just dive in uh, with uh, Sebastian uh, and uh, start with a question, which is, uh, so in uh, Ed Lemer's discussion of the twin deficits, uh, and, and he talked about how these are, are, are linked, um, but kind of what, what I'd like to explore a bit, uh, and maybe you can start the discussion on this, is so these tariffs are being imposed, and they're going to increase the price of uh, certain metals coming into the U.S. and maybe more tariffs imposed, uh, and, and, and we know these two are linked. But then, what are the implications here? What happens with uh, with with U.S. exports? What happens with uh, exchange rates? How does this? How do we get to a new? Uh, equilibrium given that tension that you have increased deficits, that means you have to have increased trade deficits. How does this all mm. resolve itself? Uh, thanks. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows. Um, and I think that the, 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 the previous uh, presenters uh, try their best. But I think that the, the main issue here, uh, Jerry, is that we really don't understand uh, what is behind uh, these tariffs. And there are, there are several possible uh, answers. And uh, um, we have heard them uh, uttered by um, the administration. Um, and I think that uh, they are all uh, wrong in mm -hmm. the sense of the reasons that are given. And, and, and so let me, let me, before getting into how this will be solved, which as I said, I don't know how it will be solved. Um, hopefully we won't have a, a trade war. Um, but one possible explanation is that this is all about the trade deficit. And we have a very large deficit and the administration has a mercantilistic view of the world where deficits are bad and we want to reduce the deficit. Well. We have a deficit, it's not that huge. It's growing, but it's not that huge. Uh, whether it's bad or not bad, that's a different question. Uh, but of course, uh, focusing on the bilateral imbalance between the US and specific countries is the wrong thing to do. And that's much of the rhetoric has to do with that. Um, however, the tariffs are not imposed on particular countries but they are imposed, and, 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 and as I said, the conversation has to do with the bilateral trade, it's, uh, they are imposed on particular goods, although they are talking about possible exemptions. Now, I have here the list of the 50 most important trading partners, so that would be about 25% of the trading partners of the US. And there are two things that stand up. I mean, it is true that we have very large uh, deficits, uh, a very large deficit with China in the bilateral sense, 
Um, oh, let, me, let me say one thing first. The data that are reliable uh, by country are only available for merchandise trade. There are estimates about services and intellectual property and so on, but those are not as reliable. The data that are provided by the census and by the US trade uh, authority is on merchandise trade. And we have about 400 billion deficit with China. But the one country that comes third or, or second, depending on, is Germany. And there's very little, the president talked a little bit about Germany at one point, but now we haven't said anything about Germany. And that brings in an important question, a point that, I, that has to do with currency values, which we may talk about later. But 16 of the 50 countries we have uh, surpluses with. Okay, and as you know, I come originally, I was born in Chile, and we have a surplus with Chile. And uh, in about a week, a new president is coming into Chile. His name is Sebastian Piñera, a good friend of Ed Lehmer, and he has a good first name, Sebastian. <laughs> and uh, and, and um, so um, I've been invited for inauguration, and I could go down and say, Mr. President, the first thing you ought to do is slap tariffs on US products. We have a deficit with the US. And no one would say that. So it, it, there is an issue here that has two aspects to, that, to it on the, on the bilateral trade. One is that it is silly. And second, um, that, um, uh, and, 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 and the way I, I want to uh, illustrate the silliness of foging, focusing on bilateral trade is that uh, no one would think that the countries uh, that, that with which we have surpluses are going to impose tariffs on the US, the UK, Brazil, the Netherlands, Belgium, Singapore, Hong Kong, 16 out of 50, not quite one half, but 16 out of 50. Um, and, 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 uh, and the second point is that uh, I think that the big elephant in the room here is Germany. If we want to talk about bilateral trade imbalances, we cannot avoid talking about Germany, which had, with, with whom we have a, almost a $70 billion deficit, which is the number two or number three largest deficit, and a country which, if the, the Deutsche Mark still existed, at the current value of its currency, which is the euro, would have to be labeled as a currency manipulator because it has an incredibly undervalued currency because the euro is not as strong as it ought to be for a country that has the productivity prowess of Germany. And we don't talk about Germany. So this is about punishing um, uh, indirectly via steel, and I will finish with this, via uh, steel and aluminum punishing uh, particular countries. And, 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 and that's an indirect, very complex way. And it reminds me of the story of a friend of mine who, uh, when he went to kindergarten, his mother was very worried about uh, the experience. And she told the teacher, um, look, uh, this boy is very sensitive. So as he misbehaves, if you slap the kid be, 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 besides him, he's going to get the lesson. So don't slap him, slap his. <laughs> Yeah, the kids sitting beside. So we are punishing those the guys that are producing uh, steel and aluminum, which are not necessarily Germany or um, or China is important, uh, in order to get the the the, the lesson through. Uh, it's the wrong policy, and is and even if this was the objective, it's the wrong instrument to try to achieve what they are trying to achieve. So I think that that uh, um, it's confusing, it's wrong. And that's why I don't know how it's going to end. Um, I have another couple of things that I could add, but let's uh, wait. Thank okay. you, Jerry. OK, so, so let's turn to, to Eric. So an important part of the uh, equation, which uh, our keynote, John McKenzie alluded to, and, and uh, David Schulman alluded to, is, is foreign investment in the US. And so we have, in addition to these uh, announced tariffs, we have a new tax overhaul bill that supposedly is going to work the other way and induce more foreign investment in the US. And perhaps you can in, enlighten us on how all of this sort of fits together or doesn't fit together, as uh, I guess Sebastian would say. OK. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. And, and we, we have more than a bill. We have a tax act. And really, uh, the biggest tax change since 1986. And pre-Trump, if you look at the US corporate and international tax regime, I think it's safe to say it was the worst of all worlds. 
It had high nominal tax rates. It was remarkably complex, generated substantial economic distortions, and it encouraged aggressive tax behavior. And it did so while raising remarkably little revenue. Really uh, not a very winning combination. So over the last 20 years, Democrats and Republicans have put forth really thoughtful proposals to change this, trying to figure out how do you make the system more competitive, how do you reduce the headline rate, and how do you uh, encourage corporations to bring profits that were not taxed overseas back. So do we have the slides, Jerry? There they are. OK. Um, so what I want to start with is, is by saying, even with the high nominal rates, U.S. corporations were not overtaxed. Despite the rhetoric, uh, their nominal rate was high, but the effective rates were comparable to other countries and, and probably even lower. So I like this chart because it shows that if you look at uh, corporate profits in the United States, they've gone up dramatically. But if you look at corporate revenues, uh, uh, tax revenues in the United States, uh, they're hovering at or below 2%. So the myth of U.S. corporations being uncompetitive uh, because of tax problems, I, I, I think, is real. All right, so one way to view the, the tax act that passed in December is really as an America first tax policy. It was a series of reforms, as Jerry said, designed to increase investment in the United States by both foreign and domestic investors. And it did that by reducing the after-tax costs of conducting operations in the US. So basically, you can look at the tax system as a tool to attract investment rather than a barrier to keep investment offshore. And it accomplished that with five major changes and um, added three new acronyms. I, I don't pretend you can read them. I actually simplified uh, the language to get them on one screen. Uh, it is unreadable, and, and these provisions are, are pretty much uncomprehensible. <laughs> so we have something called FIDI, uh, the foreign uh, domestic, uh, foreign derived intangible income, BEAT, which is base erosion anti-abuse tax, and my favorite, GUILTY, uh, <laughs> which is uh, um, a global intangible low tax income. All right, so how did, how did we make the U.S. a really great place for investment? Uh, we basically went all in on short-term growth. So reduce the rate to 21%. We have full expensing, at least to 2022, uh, of all new capital expenditures. We provided a regime to repatriate foreign untaxed profits at relatively low rates. And we added something called the foreign-derived intangible income, FIDI, which basically encourages companies to keep their uh, uh, research and development and other operations in the United States. Uh, several European finance ministers believe FIDI is an illegal export subsidy that violates the WTO, mostly because it is an illegal export subsidy that violates the WTO. <laughs> All right, and then finally we have something called BEAT, the base erosion tax. And this is aimed at not just those countries that, companies that uh, uh, had inversions, but to maintain the U.S. tax base on, on operations. Okay, but another way this tax policy is an America last tax policy, in that it taxes uh, foreign profits at a much lower rate than domestic profits. And if the U.S. really wanted to encourage investment in the United States, it would have had what is called a pure worldwide tax system. All right? But what we really have in the United States, both before and after, is a hybrid system. Because we didn't tax corporations on their worldwide income. As long as they kept the uh, profits overseas, the tax rate, the U.S. tax rate on that was zero. And that's two to three trillion dollars of profits that were never taxed in the United States. On the other side, the territorial tax system was never really a pure territorial tax system. It implies in some countries to uh, um, uh, only active income, and most importantly, and this is what guilty is in the United States, it imposes a minimum tax on foreign income. So what we have grossly simplified is a 
territorial system for the normal rate of return, but a worldwide system for any excess profits. And how it's defined is really important for our purposes, Jerry, because you're allowed a 10% rate of return on your tangible investments overseas. So this will encourage those companies that have very little tangible investments to acquire assets outside the United States. All right, and this is all based on two things. When you think, is the US tax system competitive, there are two different ways of focusing on it. One, are US-based manufacturers able to compete with manufacturers overseas? And that's the America first part. But the second one is, are US multinationals able to compete with foreign multinationals? Can our companies beat up on the German, the Japanese, the Chinese in markets outside the United States? And thinking about those two, they're really consistent. So let me wrap up, Jerry, by saying what do we have in our Trump tax policy? Well, we have low nominal rates and because of expensing, even lower effective tax rates. We have, if possible, an even more complex tax system than we had before. Uh, we have a tax system that I think has less economic distortions than, than the current one. And I think it still encourages aggressive behavior. And what we'll see is tax lawyers and tax accountants struggling to uh, understand FIDI, BEEP, and, 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 and guilty and structure arrangements to avoid that. And finally, as, as you mentioned in the first program, we, we have a corporate tax system that will raise substantially less revenue than before. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now let's uh, turn to, to Michael. And uh, Michael, as you know, my interest is uh, in California. And California is not one economy. It's many economies. We have the cannabis economy in the great state of Jefferson. Uh, we have tech in the Bay Area, uh, aerospace and Hollywood and med tech uh, in Southern California. Uh, how is all of this, the tax and trade policy, what do you see the differential impact? I mean, the Bay Area has really led California in growth. Uh, is, is that going to change? Is the, the, so the spatial dis distribution of activity going to change because of this? And, and maybe you can enlighten us on some of that. Yeah, and I think that looking at it from a, a, a regional perspective um, suggests that the impacts of these um, scenarios um, could be quite different on the, on the different major regions of California. Uh, as you know, everyone here, we're in this great uncertainty of exactly what, uh, what the scenario is. Is it a bunch of trade wars? Is it a bunch of bilateral? Um, uh, moves, is it, you know, sort of this in, in the uh, ramping up of, of selective um, uh, enforcement mechanisms. But I think sort of just s s stepping back from that, one can see that the strengths of the regions are different and so are the vulnerabilities. So if we think about the Bay Area, that's right. I mean, the, the big motor uh, of the economy, of the California economy, at least on the side of innovation and wages, and, and capital formation, that's the Bay Area. Um, on you know, one scenario is that the Bay Area is so leading edge in terms of technology that nobody around the planet will uh, go so far as to uh, somehow cut themselves off from what they need from the Bay Area, which are in many ways unique goods and services that don't have easy substitutes. In, um, in other uh, markets around the world, and that that's, you know, it's a bit of a sort of a natural protection for the Bay Area. That's, that's one, one view. Um, however, you know, a non-evidence-based kind of emotionally driven trade policy um, could maybe ignore that sort of scenario. And I think we, we, we obviously see that uh, China has a, a very aggressive uh, framework for promoting itself as a technology leader. It's the, it's the linchpin of the, of the China development strategy, which is to, to become a major tech power. And they have thus far played their cards rather well in enabling the vast domestic market in China to permit development of domestic alternatives to American leading multinational tech companies. So um, many people recognize that. 
what is the what is the scenario of the kind of the 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 um, the the showdown here or the or the standoff over China's ability to do that. And I would add, uh, and, and of course, the, the consequences of that for the Bay Area will, will be vast. Um, on the, possibly on a, you know, one scenario is that, is, that, is that China is pushed into playing more by world trading rules and that will, that will be very advantageous for the Bay Area because they're losing a lot under, the current, um, under current Chinese behavior. On the other hand, um, should uh, uh, China not back down and we go into some uh, real more kind of aggressive trade war over tech, there's another party out there waiting in the wings to see uh, what this looks like, and that's called the European Union. European Union, countries in the European Union are very upset, um, more than gets, I think, in the press about American technological dominance. It's a real sore spot in Europe. And we know this because it comes out in the political system through tensions over things like privacy laws and, of course, um, uh, European interpretations of antitrust. Uh, there is no other big region of the world that would, in a way, love more for there to be a demonstrated way to cut into American technological advantage and permit Europe tech companies to take what is seen in Europe as their, as their missed place in the world tech market. Um, I'm not saying that there are actual plans to do that in Europe, but spe I spend a lot of time in Europe and at the Commission in Brussels, and I know that that's what a lot of people think. So it's a three-way game, actually, not a two-way game. And, um, and that intersects with, what I think, what Sebastian said about Germany, which is very interesting. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, Germany, of course, its strength is in mechanical engineering, and its trade surplus is mostly in that area uh, with us. But um, any, any, any worldwide game among the three great blocs of China, the EU, and, and, and America m might involve Europe kind of counterattacking and in in trying to get, in, get a bigger part of the world tech market. There's huge implications uh, for the Bay Area. A uh, couple just point, Southern California, I think you know, Jerry mentioned, um, entertainment and aerospace. I don't think entertainment and aerospace are particularly vulnerable um, uh, to, to, to what's going on. Um, entertainment is, um, it's, uh, it's not easily, again, it's, there's not easily easy substitutes. So the products are, are very well marketable. Aerospace is already highly regulated. Um, but I would worry about greater impacts on the broader Southern California manu manufacturing sector, which is much more price sensitive than the economy of the Bay Area. So it's much more sensitive to rule changes and tariff changes across, I mean, as an average across the Southern California economy, simply because we're positioned lower in the, uh, in the kind of tech and quality food chain than the Bay Area is. And then the third great area would, of course, be Central Valley. It's a huge exporter, very dependent on exports, specialized agricultural goods. Um, hard to say whether that could become part of a tit for tat. Um, I know that, for example, you take specialty oranges, the good ones that come from places like the Ojai Valley, they're heavily, they're heavily sold um, for, uh, for uh, holiday periods in, in places like Korea and China. That kind of goes under the radar. But if you get into a trade war with China, it can hit uh, a lot more areas than, 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 than we see in the, in the press that get, a lot of, that get a lot of attention. As for the big ag commodity sectors, um, that, that's going to be mostly the Midwest. And you know, Brazil is waiting in the wings, right? They're just waiting for uh, us to get into big trade difficulties with China so they can ramp up more production of soybeans you know, and cut down more Amazon forests. And they have plenty of land and plenty of tech to do it with. I think it's a highly, again, so when you break it down geographically, the, the impacts you know, could be quite different from region to region. Thank you. And um, so, so now I'd like to open it up for discussion and maybe start with a question for Ed of something that um, we touched on in the earlier session, uh, but maybe we can expand on. Uh, we were talking about the, the bond market, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so there was a, a recent, recent being yesterday, uh, article put out by Brookings, which suggested that uh, the appropriate response of other countries to these tariffs was not to uh, 
put tariffs on the U.S., but to dump their treasury bills and, uh, and, and make U.S. savers uh, fund the U.S. deficit. Uh, and, and you touched on that as being a problem. Can you elaborate yeah, this on that? That's a huge risk. But, you know, I was listening to these gentlemen talk, and it occurred to me that nobody has really identified the basic problem that the Trump administration is trying to address. And I don't know if you're going to bring this up at some point, but... No, go ahead. <clears throat> So we had, uh, we built the middle class in this country in our factories. We had 35% of our workforce in the manufacturing back in the 60s. When Trump says make America great again, he's really talking about reinvigorating the manufacturing sector and the coal mining sector, the sort of manly man jobs. We're now down to 9 or 8% uh, employment in manufacturing. And uh, it, they're, they're real uh, outlier here is China. It's not Germany, because China went from being a, a hardly an exporter to the United States to being the principal exporter. And a huge surge of, of uh, manufacturing products came from China over a very short period of time. It, it, it was a kind of surge no economist expected to see hitting the United States. It's just a flood of products. So the question then is, to what extent does that flood of products exacerbate the problem that we're not building our democracy in our factories anymore. We don't have enough manufacturing jobs. We're down to 8% or 9% now. And there have been studies, uh, a kind of classic study, or what will prove to be a classic study that draws a lot of attention by Otter, Dorn, and Hansen, in which they link the surge in, in imports from China by its product mix to counties inside the United States and show that the counties that had exposure that were producing the kinds of products that were being surged in supply from, uh, from China, those were the ones that have had the most adverse outcome in terms of job loss and lingering unemployment. Uh, so we have a huge problem. We have a lot of sort of stranded workers in these previous manufacturing sectors, and Trump would like to help them out in some material way. And, and uh, steel and, and uh, aluminum aren't nearly enough. Uh, uh, electronics, consumer electronics is a big part of the story. So the hypothetical is could we be great again? Could we bring back manufacturing jobs to the United States if we could pretend that China didn't exist or, or put quotas on or put tariffs on to limit the imports into the United States? That's the hypothetical. How much can Trump deliver on that promise? I think very little, to be honest. I think probably uh, <coughs> that's, you can get back 1 or 2% of manufacturing. There are some communities that could be helped substantially. I mean, I'm from upstate New York, and upstate New York, every town or city in upstate New York has substantial manufacturing. I, I, IBM was where I came from, but Kodak and, and Ansco, they all have, they're all gone. And, and the population is just leaving. All the young kids are leaving because there's nothing to do. And this country has a big, serious problem of what to do with its high school graduates. So I, I think that rather than worrying about the deficits per se and economic growth that's induced by the policy, we ought to think about what's the fundamental driver and what are we going to do with the workforce that we have and how are we going to maintain a strong democracy in the absence of a vibrant manufacturing sector. Yeah, um, no, I think that we are uh, in agreement with Ed, and that's, uh, uh, so, so, so I think that what you're saying is that China, or, or what China exports to the U.S. has created this, or has exacerbated this problem with the middle class, and that if we want to make America great again, we should focus on that. And, um, one attitude is that it is unavoidable and that uh, there's nothing to be done. Another one, which I think is the right attitude for economists, is to say, well, that's what the politicians want to do. Let's find the optimal way, the least costly way of achieving that. And uh, so if China is a problem, we have to use China-specific tools. And if the manufacturing sector is a problem, we have to use manufacturing sector-specific rules. And the problem with the tariffs, and, and, and I think that Ed agrees with this, and I, or you uh, intimated this, with the tariffs on uh, steel and aluminum, is that they're neither targeted in a precise way China, and there we have other tools which we have never used, which is labeling China a currency manipulator. The, the, it's in the books. 
Um, um, and, uh, and, and the other problem, uh, if, if one takes seriously what Ed uh, has said, which I think we should, goes back to Jerry's original question, which is what's going to be the effect here? And there is an old concept in international trade which has been discarded, sort of, which is the effective rate of protection, which is the net protection that you provide to an industry. Once you take into account all the inputs and whether the inputs used by particular industries are, um, are, are subject to import tariffs or not. And there are a number of industries in the US that use aluminum and steel, uh, and now with a higher price, they are going to have a lower rate of protection. So there is a general equilibrium, to use economist jargon, um, effect here that this administration has completely ignored. And I'm not expecting the president to understand that, but uh, he does have uh, a couple of advisors, I think, who are economists. Well, one less. Fewer today. Fewer today than yesterday, that is true. Uh, but he still has a couple of advisors who are economists. And, and, and the notion that you have to use the, mo the most adequate tool to achieve particular goals is very old in economics, and they've given a lot of Nobel Prizes to that, Tinbergen and Bob Mandel and others. So that's what is very confusing, I think, in, in, in this whole discussion. Uh, what are they trying to achieve? We don't know. And, uh, and, and if you go through all the alternatives, it turns out that um, the tariffs on steel and aluminum, uh, are, it's very difficult to, um, to argue that they are the solution to anything. Can I just say one thing on this before you go on to the others? And that's that um, I think that uh, the problem is the external deficit. Because if you had balanced trade, a surge in imports from China would be offset by a surge of exports. The deficit is very small. It's 2.6% of GDP. Very, very small. It used to be 7% of GDP. We were all very worried. But 2.5% ain't big, man. It really isn't. And the surplus, the, the, the Chinese surplus is less than 2% of oh, their yeah, GDP. We, OK, we'll have to talk about the details of this. But I think the but those are the deficit details. is a big problem here. So, so, so I want to turn the conversation a little bit to the, the stability of these policies. So we have this tax overhaul. And, uh, and in our forecast, you saw the trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. Uh, we have the, the, the twin, uh, twin deficits. There are incentives for investing in the US. Uh, but all of that, and, and, and the new trade uh, restrictions or tariffs that are supposed to realign the trading environment. Uh, and, and we think about these in terms of getting to some general equilibrium as, as if they're stable. Uh, but, uh, but there's a real chance that these are not going to be stable, that the next administration, uh, whether it's Republican or, 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 or Democrat, will, uh, will go back to free trade and get rid of it. Are you intimating that President Trump will not be reelected? I just said next administration. You said it, but that, yeah, you said so it. So the, the one that's after? Yeah, you think, oh, OK. So I get it. There was no presumption there. Oh, OK. Uh, the, the, Never mind. <laughs> there was another comment. Uh, but, but, but at any, any rate, an, an investor uh, or, or a business person who's looking at, at these that, that are supposed to provide new incentives, uh, wouldn't they think that, well, let's wait a while and see how stable these are? And, and, and doesn't that mean that, that we, you know, it might not be so effective? Uh, or are, are we going to see businesses responding with investment and change behavior? And, um, it's an open question for everyone. Yeah, so, so, Jerry, I'll start with that. Um, if, if we compare this change, tax law change, to 1986, it, it's a completely different world. So in 1986, we had bipartisan support. Uh, this legislation was passed uh, uh, only with Republican votes. The second part is 1986 had permanent provisions. This legislation has a series of provisions that are temporary. The two most notable are the individual tax cuts and the expensing uh, of new capital investment. And, and so if you answer Jerry's question, if you were looking at the expensing provision, well, it has two effects. Either it has a long-term effect when you're saying, if I'm going to engage in these series of investments to build up capacity, 
I know I'm only going to get it for the first couple of years. Maybe this isn't a good strategy. Or the second effect, which I think will dominate, is I was going to make these investments anyhow. What I'll do is I'll accelerate year 2023 and bring it forward. Right. And, and then the big thing, which you went over in the first session, is the tax reform, in order to get it passed with less than uh, 60 votes in the Senate, uh, was capped at $1.5 trillion deficit. And, and to earn that off, uh, the economy would have to grow at a rate of approximately 4.5% a year. And, and you know we're not going to have that growth. And in year two or three, there's going to be the same type of pressure for tax reform that we saw in the Reagan era when, when he passed the 1981 Tax Act for changes to go. So, so in, in answer to your question, Jerry, I don't think it's a very stable world. May I say one very, I, but, but I, don't, I don't think, Eric, that the nominal rate could be hiked given what other countries have done. I mean, the French have 15 percent, the European Union is lowering, the, so the nominal, whatever it's done, right. correcting, it's not going to come through change of the 21 percent, I think. Yeah. And I agree. It may go up one percentage point or two percentage points, but the days of over 25 percent corporate taxation is, is over. So any, any other thoughts on the stability and what that means for... Uh, okay, so... Um, let me, let me, yeah, let me so add one thing about stability. I just came back from Mexico and I had meetings with uh, people at the highest level, including the Secretary of the Treasury. For Mexico, the end of NAFTA, it's a big problem because NAFTA mostly provides stability of the rules of the game. Because um, if it's, it's a country subject to a much wider political swings than we are. And now the leading candidate is a leftist called Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, and he may come in. So the Mexicans are particularly concerned, not so much because they will have to pay a higher import duty for trucks exported to the US, but the stability notion that, that, the, that, that adds credibility, bought credibility to them of NAFTA, is going to be doubted going forward by investors. Mm -hmm. So the issue is not only about the US, but what it does to some of the other countries in the region. And for Mexico, it's particularly important. Yeah, so, th so that brings me to my uh, next question, that, which is uh, the WTO. So un undoubtedly, there's going to be some challenge to this with the WTO. Uh, and, and let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, that the WTO says, no, these uh, tariffs and some of this tax law change are in violation of WTO rules. You, the United States, have to rescind them. What then? The uh, Trump administration has said, well, we might just pull out of the WTO. Right. Or the process will take so long that you mm -hmm. kick the can down the road. So, so this is my comment about the next administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, you raise this question of what's the retaliation. Yeah. Uh, you, you, beforehand, you brought it up in the context of WTO, because if the uh, retaliation is increased uh, trade barriers by other countries, and you get into a trade war, that's going to be the end of the WTO. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the wiser retaliation is not through goods, it's through lending. So you've got all these external balances of treasury bills and bonds. If the Chinese start cashing those out, I mean, we, we're, we've been in this codependent situation with China for a long time where we depend upon their loans and they depend upon us buying their products. And you can't break one without breaking the other. Both countries are going to lose in the context of that. But the proper retaliation, I think, by the Chinese and by other Asian countries that have surpluses with the United States is stop buying treasury bills. I, but, but this goes back to my story about Eddie and, and, yeah. and his mother. I mean, we're not doing anything to the Chinese. We're doing things to steel producers and aluminum producers, of which there are some Chinese. Uh, lots of Canadian producers. I don't know how that happened, but it did happen. Lots of, uh, so, China, I think uh, Mr. Chi is about to be reappointed. Uh, there was a constitutional change in the way the Chinese do it, and now they can reappoint him forever. Um, so I don't think that China well, that's will need, will want to, to, to retaliate in a, in a big way. We are, not, we are not pointing to them. We are not shaming them. 
uh, we're not doing anything. I mean, we're Peter Navarro has written about four books that have some I mean, who is statement I, about I, 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 the I'm, title. Who is Peter Navarro? <laughs> but he's the who, guy. Who is who is that person? You don't know? Are you serious? Yeah. No, but I'm. What's but the, I'm. 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 What's the meaning of that? I'm fifty percent serious. I mean. <laughs> Well, try being 100%. Yeah, yeah. But, but my, my point is that you, you've got a, uh, the first step in a multi-steps process. And the Trump uh, <coughs> rhetoric during his campaign was totally anti-China. The idea that China isn't going to be a target, maybe not now because of North Korea, but China is a trading partner with the United States, with Navarro and I'm sure Wilbur Ross, too. They're going to go along with that. So, I'm, and again, I think China's going to have to decide how to retaliate, as do other countries. So can I ask a question to Michael? Yes. About yes. California? So um, we also have a very vibrant, um, in, here in Southern California, still textile and garment industry. Um, now, the, the I mean, even the effective rate of protection, I don't think it's direct. But it, once all the dominoes go into place, is it, what, what do you think will happen, if anything? Or is this more or less um, sort of protected because it's so different from what is happening right now? So again, it's really hard to tell. It depends on, on who is, you know, which textile industries might be the object of significant new tariffs or, or protection devices, right? There are a lot of alternative places to produce apparel and textiles in the world, and it's pretty easy to shift production. It doesn't take a lot of time, nor really even all that much capital anymore. So the shift, the geographical shiftability, is pretty is pretty easy. So again, do, you know, do we go full out and try to bring the textile industry really back to the United States? But I think that presumes a collapse of the world trade system, uh, the whole full out trade war, end of the WTO, and then fine, we'll make our own clothes again. Uh, if it's um, if it's something short of that, uh, yes, we could inflict damage on certain producer countries. My guess is though that not that much of it ends up back here in, in Southern California. Right, and, and that's what's happened already in textiles with the high cost of manufacturing in China and it moved, it moved in to a Vietnam day to Vietnam and, and Bangladesh, Bangladesh yeah. right. Turkey right. and all that. Uh, but, but let me follow that with, uh, with a question about uh, interest rates. So even if it's not a, a full-on dumping of treasuries, if uh, China and Korea and Japan uh, just stop buying treasuries uh, and, and there's this big deficit to, to, to fund, uh, does that have a differential geographical impact okay. when the interest rates go up? So you are Mr. You are Mr. Chi's uh, advisor and you go to him and tell him, let's punish these guys, let's not buy more uh, uh, treasury, yeah. uh, US treasury bills. The surplus is not, because most people don't know this, it used to be 10% of China's GDP. Now it's less than 2%. Right. But it's still 2% of a very large number. It's still very large. OK, so we, we ain't buying no more with the surplus. <laughs> no more US treasuries. OK, so let's, what are we going to buy? Land in UK, West Guild, huh? Land in West Bank. Yeah, so I mean, what are we going to buy? I mean, I'm, now I'm Mr. China, and I have here, I don't know, $200 billion to spend on, on, on securities. China, uh, what am I going to buy? Japanese stuff? No. UK gilders? No. Swiss francs? No. Copper mines. Uh, copper mines, yeah. In, in, in Chile. Chile. In Chile, yeah. <laughs> and soybean uh, farms in Brazil. But, but the truth of the matter is that they're going to diversify their population. They don't have too many options. It's, this is very interesting. And, 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 and Peter Navarro has not looked at the big picture. But they are Whoever wisely, he is. They're wisely yeah. shifting into hard assets rather than treasury. Yeah, assets. but they've been doing that for a long time. Yeah, but yeah. more of that is likely to occur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But are, are, are there differential impacts around California of these higher interest rates? And we have higher interest rates in our forecast, but what we're talking about now is, is much higher than the forecast were we to get into this kind of trade war. Well, what is interesting, I was not, I wasn't unable to come here in the morning. What I think it's interesting is that last time the Fed raised rates big time, which was uh, 2005, after 2005, we faced what uh, Greenspan at the time called the conundrum, which is that the long rate didn't move. And we just went from 1% to, I don't know, 5% or 5 and a quarter percent to the federal funds rate, and the 10-year the, the yield uh, yesterday put. Now it's moving up. 
So there's no conundrum anymore. And the question is why? And I think Ed has an answer to that. Well, I think we're chasing. The, the, the lower it's the other way around. Chasing, yeah. Yeah, the other okay. around. And, and the 10-year Treasury is building in uh, inflation. So you think the, 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 the 10-year note has a life of its own? And by the way, the, our forecast is for higher interest rates, but not higher real rates. Right. It's because of inflation becoming more of a serious issue. Mm -hmm. So let's finish with uh, uh, one last question for each of you. Same question. Uh, so in my earlier presentation, I showed the, these elephants and looking for patterns that would lead us to project into the future. Um, there are a lot of things going on today in terms of policy, one on top of another. Uh, and, and so my question for the panel is, what historical experiences, United States or Argentina or whatever, uh, do we know of that have any similarity to what we're looking at today? And, and, and what happened there? Anyone have any? Thoughts on that? Well, it's yeah. more, it's, I'll go ahead. I mean, look, oh, well, the depressing scenario, of course, I think that most people think about is uh, what happened to the last great globalization, which was the end of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, right? If you, I think if you were to put yourself in someone's shoes in 1900, um, you would be living through an incredible, exhilarating technological revolution, a change in lifestyles, very much like what just happened with the IT revolution. You would have been living through a period where you were 30 or 40 years into expanding world trade and no great wars. Um, you would have seen you know, advances in telecommunications and uh, declining trade costs, glittering cities full of cultural innovation that were extremely cosmopolitan places like you know, Berlin and Vienna and Paris and London and New York, and so on and so forth, right? So that's 1900. And if you look at what happens in the, uh, the, what happens in the subsequent decades is um, pretty depressing, right? In terms of the collapse of the world trade system because of tensions that arise uh, due to populist movements that, have, that themselves arise because you get crushing inequalities that grow within a generally prosperous world economy leading to a kind of a wedge between domestic politics and uh, globalization, technology, capital flows, and so on. Um, sorry to be depressing, but there are parallels here. Yeah, I think that, that uh, uh, Michael is right. The, to give more granularity, that process sort of uh, ended up in the smooth holly a yeah. uh, tariff of uh, 1931, uh, followed by the British uh, Imperial Preferences Act, uh, um, and uh, followed by protectionism and import substitution policies throughout the Third World. And it took a long time to revert that protectionist uh, uh, movement. And uh, uh, an interesting story is that uh, in 1933, uh, newly elected president uh, FDR appointed the trade, free trade champion in the Senate, Cordell Hull, as uh, Secretary of, uh, of State. And in spite of that and all the effort that Hull put into opening up international trade, uh, he wasn't able to do it. Now, of course, the war inter interfered, but from 33 to 41, the US basically did not open up. And, and, and so I think the lesson is that once we close up, it's very difficult to revert that. And, 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 and that's why I think that in this panel, the most depressing aspect is what uh, Ed uh, intimated, which is that the WTO may come to an end with the world trading system, the way we have organized. And that, that I think, would be really serious. Yeah. And on the tax side, I think the US changes will uh, result in many other countries changing their tax systems to allegedly make their tax systems more competitive. I think this will result in a reduced tax on capital income uh, some economists will think that's good. Uh, some people concerned about um, uh, uh, government, particularly government, making investments to try and uh, improve uh, economic mobility, reduce poverty, uh, uh, that that's more problematic. The countries that have taken the lead in trying to protect their tax base would be the UK and their diverted profits tax. Uh, India and, and Australia have similar versions where they're focusing 
on minimizing their tax liability of their companies operating outside their country and maximizing the tax liability for companies, uh, uh, foreign companies operating in their country, uh, a strategy that the U.S. would like to pursue. Can I add one little comment? Sure. So I think just to sort of uh, deepen the point that the politics, I think, behind the, the, the turn against uh, globalization and trade are, are coming, as we know, from uh, basically people who have suffered from, uh, who have not taken had advantages or have not been winning in this transition due to new technologies and trade and globalization. There are vast swaths of this country and every other developed country, huge regions and huge parts of the population that have not done well. So um, I don't believe, unfortunately, that this administration is, 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 is making uh, moves that will benefit them strongly. But they're very, the optics are very good, and that's very politically animating for those groups of people. We just had another election in Italy the other day. It's exactly the same thing. A huge populist revolt, and a lot of it was anti-EU, anti-euro, anti, anti-trade. Anti so we, I think the challenge is that to keep, to keep uh, the trade system open, we're going to have to deal with the problems of economic transition that we have internally in all of, the, in all of our countries. And that means finding jobs for these people and finding activities for their regions because they're stuck there. They're not able to migrate anymore to opportunity. So I was going to say the same thing, which is when things go bad, the first one to blame it on is the foreigner always. That's right. And we need to do all that we can to divert this political conversation away from the foreigners and onto our, us, ourselves, so, which are education and progressive income taxes make right. America better That's again. Right. No, yeah, I was going to say that what, what Ed, I, I was going to say what Ed said, um, which I, I think is a little different from what, what Michael was saying. I don't think, I, I think that, of course, the, the, the result of the Italian election is anti-establishment. Uh, but uh, Michael uh, mentioned anti-EU and anti, it's true, but I think mostly is anti-immigrants. Um, and they are against the EU because it's Brussels and Madame Merkel, the one who is sort of calling the shots on immigration. So I think that at the end, what is really very, very uh, uh, serious and, and I'm highly concerned is this blaming uh, the, the other. Uh, and the yes. other is in, in, in the old uh, Latin American type of uh, populist story, the other was a multinational corporation the U.S. banks, the IMF, those guys, but were institutions, companies. Now the other in the, in, in, in the populist reaction in the advanced countries are people, people of color. And that, I think, uh, being a migrant myself, it's really very complicated. And, and, and we should, as Ed says, stop it. Okay, so stop um, it. So, so now that we've totally depressed everyone, and they're all on, we need a drink. They're all on Yelp looking for when the bar is open. Uh, so, 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 so let me uh, uh, close this out with what I think each of you have said is kind of a, a call to action that it's important for us as educators and for us as, as the public uh, to point solutions to the real problems that are under this. Uh, underlying this, you know, rather than uh, this is horrible, uh, there's another way to accomplish uh, the goals of the of the underlying problems. So, uh, let me thank each of you for taking of your time and, and coming to share your thoughts with us. And uh, would you join me in thanking our panel?